Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. James Baldwin once said, black people need witnesses. It's so good to see so many witnesses in the building tonight. Um, the essay that I have the pleasure of reading was first published in 1969 as, um, as the introduction to Lorraine Hansberry's posthumous autobiography, To Be Young, Gifted, and Black. <clears throat> and it is a eulogy of sorts. Um, what I love about this essay is that it speaks to two of James Baldwin's enduring loves, his love for the theater and his love for black women. This piece is called Sweet Lorraine. Sweet Lorraine. Hm. That's the way I always felt about her, and so I won't apologize for calling her that now. She understood it. In that far too brief a time when we walked and talked and laughed and drank together, sometimes in the streets and bars and restaurants of the village, sometimes at her house, sometimes at my house, sometimes gracelessly fleeing the houses of others, and sometimes seeming, for anyone who didn't know us, to be having a knock-down, drag-out battle. We spent a lot of time arguing about history and tremendously related subjects in her Bleecker Street and later Waverly Place flats. And often, just when I was certain that she was about to throw me out as being altogether too rowdy a type, she would stand up, her hands on her hips, for these down-home se sessions she would always wear slacks, and pick up my empty glass as though she intended to throw it at me. Then she would walk into the kitchen saying with a haughty toss of her head, really, Jimmy, you ain't right, child. <laughs> with which stern put down, she would hand me another drink and launch into a brilliant analysis of just why I wasn't right. I would often stagger down her stairs as the sun came up, usually in the middle of a paragraph and always in the middle of a laugh. That marvelous laugh, that marvelous face. I loved her. She was my sister and my comrade. Her going did not so much make me lonely as make me realize how lonely we were. We had that respect for each other, which perhaps is only felt by people on the same side of the barricades, listening to the accumulating thunder of the hooves of horses and the treads of tanks. Now, the first time I ever saw Lorraine was at the actor's studio in the winter of 58, 59. She was there as an observer of the workshop production of Giovanni's Room. She sat way up in the, ble the bleachers, taking on some of the biggest names in the American theater because she had liked the play and they, they hadn't. I was enormously grateful to her. She seemed to speak for me. And afterwards, she talked, with, she talked to me with a gentleness and generosity never to be forgotten. She was a small, shy, determined person. And with that strength dictated by absolutely impersonal ambition. She was not trying to make it. She was trying to keep the faith. We really met, however, in Philadelphia in 1959 when A Raisin in the Sun was at the beginning of its amazing career. Now, much has been written about this play. I personally feel that it will demand a far less guilty and constricted people than the present day Americans to be able to assess it at all as a historical achievement. Anyway, no one can gainsay its importance. What is relevant here is that I have never in my life seen so many black people in the theater. And the reason was that Never in the history of the American theater had so much of the truth of black people's lives been seen on the stage. Black people ignored the theater because the theater had always ignored them. But in Raisin in the Sun, black people recognized that house and all the people in it, the mother, the son, the daughter, and the daughter-in-law, and supplied the play with a kind of interpretive element that could not be present in the minds of white people. It was a kind of claustrophobic terror created not only by their knowledge of the house, but by their knowledge of the streets. And when the curtain came down, Lorraine and I found ourselves in the backstage alley where she was immediately mobbed. I produced a pen and Lorraine, Lorraine handed me her handbag and began signing autographs. It only happens once, she said. I stood there and watched. I watched the people who loved Lorraine for what she had brought to them. And then I watched Lorraine who loved the people for what they had brought to her. You see, it was not for her a matter of being admired. 
she was being corroborated and confirmed. She was wise enough and honest enough to recognize that black American artists are in a very special case. One is not merely an artist and one is not judged merely as an artist. The black people crowding around Lorraine, whether or not they considered her an artist, they surely considered her a witness. This country's concept of art and artists has the effect, scarcely worth mentioning by now, of isolating the artists from the people. One can see the effect of this in the irrelevance of so much of the work produced by celebrated white artists. But the effect of this isolation on the black artist is absolutely fatal. He is already, as a black American citizen, isolated from his white countrymen. At the crucial hour, he can hardly look to his artistic peers for help, for they, don't, for they do not know enough about him to be able to correct him. To continue to grow, to remain in touch with himself, he needs the support of that community. And when he is effectively removed, he falls silent, and the people have lost another hope. Much of the strain under which Lorraine worked was produced by her knowledge of this reality and her determined refusal to be destroyed by it. She was a very young woman with an overpowering vision, and fame had come to her early. She must have certainly have wished often enough that fame had, fame had seemed to drag its feet a little bit. For fame and recognition are not synonyms, especially not here. And her fame was to cause her to be criticized very harshly, very loudly, and very often by both black and white people who were unable to believe, apparently, that a really serious intention could be contained in so small and glamorous a frame. She took it all with a kind of astringent good humor, refusing, for example, to even consider defending herself when she was being accused of being a slumlord because of her family's real estate holdings in Chicago. I remember I called her during that time and all she said with the wry laugh was, Jimmy, do you realize you're only the second person who's called me today? And you know how my phone had been ringing before. She was not surprised. She was devoted to the human race, but she was not romantic about it. When so bright a light goes out so early, when so gifted an artist goes so soon, we are left with a sorrow and wonder which speculation cannot assuage. One's filled with a with a long time, one is filled for a long time with a sense of injustice, as futile as it is powerful. And the vanished person fills the mind in this or that attitude, doing this or that. Sometimes, very briefly, one hears the exact inflection of her voice, the exact timbre of her laugh, as I have when watching the dramatic presentation to be young, gifted, and black, and in reading through these pages. For Lorraine made no bones about asserting that art has a purpose, and that its purpose was action, that it contained the energy which could change things. It would be good to have her now, to have her around now, that small, dark girl with her wit, her wonder, and her eloquent compassion. I've only met one person Lorraine couldn't get through to, and that was the late Bobby Kennedy. And the years that have passed since that uh, stormy meeting, Lorraine talks about it in these pages, so I won't go into it here. I very often pondered what, sh what she then tried to convey, that a Holocaust is no respecter of persons, that what today seems merely humiliation and injustice for a few can unchecked become terror for the many snuffing out white lives just as though they were black lives. That if the American state cannot protect the lives of black citizens, then the entire state would find itself engulfed. And the horses and tanks are indeed upon us, and the end is not in sight. Perhaps it is just as well after all that she did not live to see with the outward eye what she saw so clearly with the inward one. And it is not at all far-fetched to suspect that what she saw contributed to the strain which killed her. For the efforts to which Lorraine was dedicated is more than enough to kill a man. I saw Lorraine in her hospital bed as she was dying. She tried to speak. She couldn't. She didn't seem frightened or sad, only exacerbated that her body no longer obeyed her. She smiled and waved but I prefer to remember her as she was the last time I saw her on her feet. We were at, of all places, the Penn Club. 
She was seated, talking, dressed in all black, wearing a very handsome, wide black hat, thin and radiant. I knew she had been ill, but I didn't know then how seriously. I said, Lorraine, baby, you look beautiful. How in the world do you do it? She was leaving. I have the impression she was on a staircase. And she turned and smiled that smile and said, it helps to develop a serious illness, Jimmy. <laughs> and she waved and disappeared. Thank you.